my friends a warm welcome to national gallery of modern art bengaluru it takes a immense pleasure for inviting you all for today's evening talk by mr ganesh shivaswami on raja ravi verma his imprint in time celebrating 125 years of the print legacy i would now like to call the director ms nazneen banu to come up and introduce the speaker for today's evening and to welcome him on stage well namaskar and a very good evening to all of you uh, first of all let me extend a very warm welcome to one and all present here this evening for uh, sparing your time and for joining us uh, today for our latest presentation which marks the 125th year of the print legacy of raja ravi verma imprints and time and before i introduce our guest speaker i would like to share a few lines which i read uh, some time back and it says art belongs to everybody and nobody art belongs to all time and no time art belongs to those who create it and to those who savor it art does not exist for art's sake it exists for people's sake and when we say that art exists for people's sake the one name that comes to my mind is the legendary the revolutionary raja ravi verma who made art accessible to a large cross section of our society through affordable lithographs of his painting the lithographs not only enhanced his reach and influence as a painter but also increased the involvement of commoners and masses in the fine arts and thus defined artistic taste among common people for several decades today as we celebrate 125th year of the print legacy of the legendary artist we have with us mr ganesh shivaswami our guest speaker this evening who's not only a savior of art but a savior as well though an advocate by profession he has taken keen interest and spent almost 3 decades of his life collecting studying and structuring the legacy of india's foremost artist raja ravi verma starting from an early age of 13 his collection of, of oleographs today is considered to be one of india's most substantial and comprehensive collections he has also assisted research scholars pursuing their doctorate and his collections has been cited in several scholarly articles and research publications not only in india but abroad in countries like us and uk he has now embarked upon a project of writing a book on ravi verma's print legacy he has conducted several exhibitions on ravi verma and the press in past in january in the year 2016 he conducted an exhibition titled the reciprocal influence of popular art and ravi verma press in coimbatore the exhibition was very well received and also traveled to pondicherry where it was inaugurated by the lieutenant governor of pondicherry he was also closely associated with the national gallery of modern art bengaluru for our past exhibition on oleographs of the ravi verma royal lithography and legacy and not only contributed substantial number of oleographs from his personal collection but also curated the exhibition for which we received very encouraging response from our visitors mr shiv swami also compiled the first online catalog of oleographs from the ravi verma press as a tribute to raja ravi verma on his centennial death anniversary in the year 2006 and today he is here with us to talk and give an insight about raja ravi verma in prints and time celebrating 125th year of the print legacy with this backdrop i request everyone to please invite our guest speaker on stage with a huge round of applause thank you madam well uh, the task before me today is to encapsulate 125 years in 45 minutes so i think i better get straight to it and every good narrative on ravi verma begins in kilimanjaro kilimanjaro is situated about 40 kilometers north of trivandrum 
and uh, during the time of the Travancore Kingdom, it was a very important aristocracy. A number of the consorts of the princesses hailed from this very illustrious family. It was the intellectual hub. It was the artistic cradle of that area. In fact, Kilimanur is the source of two Kathakali plays. One of it is Ravana Vijayam, which was written by Vidwan Koltambran, and the other is Kamsavat, which was written by Kilimano Ravivarma Tambran, who lived between 1782 and 1854. Kilimano itself had this Kathakali troupe with it, so it sponsored Kathakali in a very big way. In the mid 19th century, lived a Maharaja called Swadi Thirunal. We all know of him as a very great composer king. But what very few of us know is that it was Swadi Thirunal who introduced into Travancore the modern period of painting. He brought in a whole lot of artists from outside. One of the artists he brought in was a man called Alagiri Naidu from Madurai. And Alagiri Naidu was very proficient in the Tanjo style of painting. Alagiri Naidu in turn taught Ravi Varma's maternal uncle, the gentleman you see on the screen now. This is a painting actually painted by Ravi Varma of his uncle. And he, uh, I went in search of his paintings and I was able to find some of Raja Raja Varma. I'm going to refer to him now as the uncle because there are actually two Raja Raja Varmas we're going to encounter today. The uncle's paintings I went in search of and I found them in the form of murals on a temple wall, the Kilimanur Sasta temple wall. And here is one of the murals. Now this mural is substantially damaged. But if you look at it, 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 the photographs actually enhance for this presentation. What you will very quickly notice is that it is very different from a Kerala mural. There are two things which are very different to it. The first thing you'll notice is that the horse, and I presume it has Sasta on it, the horse is in gallop. So you actually have movement now entering the Kerala murals. And if you look at the landscape, the landscape recedes. So the second thing which you're getting new into Kerala murals is perspective. So both of these new things are brought in through the uncle, Raja Raja Varma. The other intellectual of Kilimanur I introduce you to this evening is Ravi Varma's own mother, Uma Ambatambarati. She wrote the dance script for a Tullal dance called Parvati Swayamvaram. And Ravi Varma, sometime in about 1900, he had this script printed into a limited edition book of 1,000 copies. The book, unfortunately, is all but vanished today. But I was able to get one copy of it. And here's the title card of Parvati Swayamvaram, written by Uma Amba Tambrati. So it is into this environment that Ravi Varma is born. That's Kilimanur, and actually the first building which you see over there, right to the very front, that's the Chitralayam, which Ravi Varma built. It wasn't there when Ravi Varma was born. So when Ravi Varma is born in 1848, he's born into this atmosphere which has a lot of art and dance and there's music and there are people who are writing scripts. So there are three things basically which Ravi Varma imbibes into him. The first thing he imbibes into him is Kathakali. And the second thing he imbibes into him is the tenets of Tanjo painting. The third thing he imbibes into him and which he's taught is social norms. Social norms, why? Because in Travancore at that point of time, like any other kingdom in India, it was not a horizontal society. It was a vertical society where you had to know your place in the system and how you deal with people above you and how to extract graces from people below you. So this is what is happening for the first 14 years when Ravi Varma is in Kilimanur. His first teacher was the uncle. And I also wanted to know whether the uncle actually influenced Ravi Varma in any way. So I go back to the mural which you just saw and we move forward in time. So what you're seeing on the screen now are three pictures. The one on the extreme left is Raja Raja Varma, the uncle. The painting in the middle is by Ravi Varma and the one on the right is the oleograph. So if you actually look, it's a compositionally exactly similar to the uncle's picture, including if you are able to very carefully observe, you can even see the umbrella. The umbrella over Sasta is positioned exactly the same way as Ravi Varma would. So Raja Raja Varma, the uncle, clearly influenced Ravi Varma. First 14 years, Ravi Varma is in Kilimanur, and at the time of his Upanayanam, Ravi Varma is taken and presented before the Maharaja, this Maharaja, Ailiam Tiranam. 
and ayaniam tirunal allows ravi verma access into his library and for the first time ravi verma is now beginning to see european art as well so by this time you have ravi verma imbibing kathakali tanjo social norms and european art and then when ravi verma is 18 he is gifted his first box of colors by this gentleman kerala verma valiya kolthambaran is also known as kerala kalidasa because he has translated a number of kalidasa's works into malayalam one of which is mayura sandesham this is 1866 so now ravi verma has also got with him the technique of european painting from 1866 to 1874 very short years ravi verma paints his first known commissioned portrait and that is this one kilakke palat krishna menam now a lot of the biography still now only have a black and white photograph of this and i went in search of the painting i said if the painting exists then it must be somewhere so i was able to find it believe it or not 3 weeks ago so for the very first time ever on display is ravi verma's very first painting and that is kilakke palat krishna menan when i first took a look at the painting i said my god all of his training has come through he's a good student so let's examine this painting i'm going to spend a few minutes on this painting because we need to realize understand whether tanjo paintings been understood kathakali has been understood so let's go step by step first is tanjo the first thing tanjo painting teaches you is to accommodate all of the figures onto your given space so spatial accommodation ravi verma gets spot on right from the beginning this is a very complex portrait it's five people ravi verma paints all of them with no problem all of them are accommodated onto the canvas Ravi Verma never had a problem right from the beginning on to the very end where he started with the face and then realized he didn't have space for the body so the body becomes smaller and then he realizes he doesn't have space for the hands and the hands become even smaller Ravi Verma never painted hangman pictures never did right from the very beginning why because Tanjo painting is teaching him spatial accommodation spatial accommodation he spot on coming to the next that is Kathakali tanjo painting also and social norms all of these are teaching you hierarchy hierarchy of placement in kathakali it's on stage in tanjo painting it's on a board and in social norms it's in society it was very important for ravi verma to understand hierarchy and he understood it very well in kathakali the dominant person is to the right of the subservient person or the dominant person is higher than the subservient person so to our visual left would always be the dominant person the servient person would be to our visual right now look at the painting the head of the family is to our extreme visual left and that is krishna menan in fact i think ravi verma sort of then says he, his head must be higher than the other people so he puts in a little kudumi is what i think but that is how ravi verma painted everybody else in the picture if you notice is either to the extreme or extreme uh, left which would be to uh, you know you're, you're getting what i'm saying or below that is how ravi verma did every painting starting from here all the way to the victory of indrajit ravi verma composed his pictures using the kathakali placement of figures just to drive the point in if this was done by a european artist the two parents would have been in the middle and you would have had the children around but that is not ravi verma's placement ravi verma's placement is the kathakali placement if for example ravi verma were to paint a picture which had a rama and a hanuman the hanuman would either be to rama's left or to our visual right or would be below rama hanuman would never be placed on rama's upper right like a teacher in a classroom that is the kathakali placement moving on let us also examine the jewelry 1870 although beautiful 
it's not entirely intricate because Ravi Verma has yet to develop that technique which comes in very much later. So in 1870, Ravi Verma was still learning jewelry. But what about drapery? Drapery by this point of time, Ravi Verma is fairly good. Because if you can actually see Krishna Menon's upper cloth, it is diaphanous. And Ravi Verma is able to get that in. Ravi Verma was able to pick in every fold and every crease of every cloth. So this is 1870. Let's move on to 1874, when Ravi Verma paints a painting called the Tamil Lady playing the Sarabhat. This is the copy. What happened with the 1874 painting? Well, the 1874 painting went to Madras and thereafter won a prize and thereafter was gifted to the Prince of Wales, later King Edward. So I said, my God, if it's gone to, Prince, to King Edward, it has to be with Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. So I did write to her. And then the curator contacted me. And they were never able to find it. So I said, no, 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 the painting's there and this is how it looks and that is how it looks. And they searched high and low and they found it. High, on a stairwell to the attic in St. James's Palace. And I said I wanted it for the lecture. So a man actually climbed up on a ladder and took a photograph of it and sent it to me specifically for the lecture. And for the very first time, 1874 on the later copy. Yes, the painting's been trimmed. So the curator was very happy. He says, oh, we finished with Ganesh. And then a second barrage of emails. Why is it trimmed? He says, I don't know why it's trimmed, Ganesh, but the catalog reads a lady playing a musical instrument. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is Tamil lady playing the Sarabhat 1, Tamil lady playing the Sarabhat 2. And why is this painting important? The painting is important because this is the first known copy made by Ravi Verma. It is this continuous demand for copies which goes into the making of the press. Here are a few copies of them. This is Shakuntala, Patralekana. These are three which I've put on the screen. I could, I could have put more. There are quite a few of them. And then even very sordid themes like Sairendri. There are a number of copies of them. Again, the one on the extreme left top becomes an oleograph and look at the Kathakali placement. Dominant is to the right of the servant and to our visual left. That's the Kathakali placement. So this keeps going on until 1884 when Madhav Rao says, look, you know what you need to do? You need to send your pictures to Europe and have them oleographed. And then he says, I, you should do it for two reasons. One is it will extend your reputation. And the second, he says, it will do great service to the country. Both of these prophecies would come true in ample measure. But to me, I found the second prophecy very intriguing. Why? Because Madhav Rao was a Marathi Brahmin. He was born in Tanjore. He became the Divan of Travancore. And he goes on to become the Divan of Baroda. I ask myself, what was the country he was talking about? The country we know today never existed in 1884, and certainly not to, uh, to the Divan, because the Divan really understood territorial differences. The only interpretation which I can make to it is that here is Madhav Rao infusing into Ravi Verma, look past the end of your nose. Look at the larger picture. And so, now we have something new being taught. And that is, look at the larger picture. This also goes into Ravi Verma establishing the press because he is now not content in just painting for commissions. He wants to paint for all, as the learned director said. 1884 to 1890, nothing really happens. And in 1890, Ravi Verma is painting a series of paintings for the Baroda Darbar quite a few of them. The paintings are first painted in Kilimanur, then they're taken to Trivandrum for an exhibition, and thereafter they are taken to Bombay where they're exhibited. And when they're exhibited in Bombay, there's so much of interest in the pictures that they say, and they really force Ravi Verma into making copies of them. Let us look at some of the paintings which go into Baroda. Arjuna and Subhadra, many of these actually do go on to become oleographs. Again, Kathakali placement. The dominant is to our visual left. 
Bharata and the Lion Cup, the birth of Krishna, Arishchandra, Kamsamaya, Kichaka Sairendri, again the Kathakali placement, dominant is to our visual left. Nalada Mayanti, Radha Madhava, Shantanu and Ganga, and in the Shantanu, the dominant is to the visual left because she is ruling that particular episode. Shantanu Matsikanda, again the Kathakali placement, and Vishwamitra Menaka, again in, at that point of time, the Kathakali placement. There were two more pictures, and the biographers could say one is Sita Siddhi, and the other is the disrobing of Draupadi. So I contacted my friends in Barota and I said, where are these pictures? They said, no, one of them is not called Sita Siddhi. It's called Sita Shuddhi. I said, why has it not come in any other biography? They said, because no one asked. So here for the very first time, again sent only for this lecture, is the first time you're going to see it in color. Sita Shuddhi. And this is Sita's Panigrahanam at the time of her marriage. And to me, it's absolutely beautiful to see the ages of Rama and Sita, completely illegal today. But it was so absolutely beautiful. This is, you're seeing it in color for the very first time. And then, of course, the disrobing of Draupadi. The disrobing of Draupadi, the Rama Varma version of it has been seen again for the first time. I'm going to keep saying for the first time, for the first time, so get used to it. Um, for the first time, you will see the disrobing of Draupadi as well. So this is the entire Baroda collection, painted in 1890. And then people go on clamoring after him by saying, look, we want copies of them. But did it actually happen? Was Ravi Varma actually asked to make copies? The answer is yes. And where do you find the source for it? In a newspaper. This is the Hindu, October 15th, 1890, and it's a good suggestion. A, a correspondent writes, from your yesterday's issue, it would appear the celebrated artist Mr. Ravivarma Koltambaran has drawn several highly admirable pictures which are intended to adorn the palace of His Highness the Gaikwad of Baroda. It would be very useful if the learned artist would have these pictures photographed and sold at a moderate price, maybe within the reach of all. It's very intriguing to me because by that time, photography clearly has already become a mainstay at least in elite India, because newspapers itself at that point of time was quite elite. So this demand then crystallizes Ravi Varma and he finally says, okay, I have to get my act together. And he deputes his brother. Now with this, Ravi Varma's sort of getting it going slowly tapers off and then the brother begins. And the brother sends a man called Abdullah Hussein all the way to Germany and he says, will you please go and get somebody who can set this press up for us? And he goes all the way to Germany, this Abdullah Hussein, and catches hold of a man called Fritz Leischer. And in 1893, signs an agreement with him. This is the very first document which we see towards the establishment of the press, 1893, 16th of June, 1893. And then they get their act together and they say, all right, we are ready to go. And the very first launch takes place with this advertisement. The Ravi Verma Fine Art Lithographic Press. An oleographic press under the above name has been opened in Girgaon, Bombay, the first of its kind in India, for the printing and publication of pictures illustrative of Indian mythology, history, and everyday life. The establishment is worked and managed by skillful and experienced European artists. The well-known Travancore artist, Mr. Ravi Varma's charming picture called The Birth of Shakuntala is now ready. And look at the last line. The price of a copy of this picture, which is an excellent oleograph, is rupees six. That's quite expensive, really. So when was The Birth of Shakuntala ready? July 12, 1894. And what is today? July 12, 2019. I invite you all to celebrate with me on the very day of the launch of the first 
oleograph. So let's take a look at the birth of Shakuntala. And there they are. The painting is on the left. And the 1894 oleograph is on the right. Again, Kathakali placement. In, at this stage, Menaka is dominant. And she goes to our visual left. So there, happy birthday, 125 years. Moving on. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with, finish with the press and I'm coming back to 1894 a little later. So what happens thereafter? Till 1898 the press is in, is in Gergaon. Then from 18, 1898 it shifts to Gutkoper because there was a plague and civil unrest. The press actually started as a partnership with Raja Raja Varma and a man called Govardhan Das. So Govardhan Das, he exits the partnership in 1898 and thereafter Raja Raja Varma owns the press as a sole proprietor. Thereafter in 1899 the press shifts to Malavli Lonavala where it finally lands up and then in 1903 Raja Raja Varma says I'm selling the press and he sells it to Fritz Fleischer. And in his diary on 9th of October 1903, the last line, he says the proprietorship of the press was in my name, though it was called after brother. So ladies and gentlemen, we need to acknowledge the people who go behind a building of a brand. The Ravi Varma brand was built by Raja Raja Varma as the initial partner and thereafter the sole proprietor. I selected these photographs, they are dull, they are damaged, but to me it was both the brothers in the very same environment, both of them are sitting on a very rickety chair. And I believe that the writing Raja Raja Varma which you see, may be Raja Raja Varma's handwriting himself. So this is the first owner of the press. The second man, on the next man on the scene is Fritz Slaisha. He's the German man who was brought in in 1893. And to me, even before I get into what he does, I wanted to know what kind of a person he was. So I searched and I was able to find that he had uh, built within his compound a beautiful beer cellar to keep his beer cold. So he liked the Oktoberfest, clearly. And then a set of photographs. So there's Slicer doing the hunt on the right, and then there's Slicer on top, and he's actually supervising planting of crop or something, so he's a bit of an agrarian. And then you have the house, so he's living in a very well-appointed house. But to me, the greatest information which I got on Slicer, and for me as a lawyer, I think was the best thing, was through legal records. Slicer sued for everything. Everything and anything, he filed a case. Or he was defending a case. And I was thinking to myself, when I started my legal practice, where was Slash? I needed a guy like him. But of course, he was well dead and gone by then. Lots and lots of cases. But there's one case which I'm going to take you through today. And you have to follow the facts closely. I have a few lawyers in the thing, so you, you'll understand. There was a man called Zimmerman, who was a German employee. And Zimmerman and Slysha got into a fight. So Slysha said something and Zimmerman retorted with bad language. So Slysha says, leave. Zimmerman says, yes, I'll leave, but I'm going to sue you. And so he does. And what does he do? In the lower court, Zimmerman wins. So Slysha takes it all the way to the first appellate court. And in the first appellate court, Zimmerman wins. So Slicer takes bad language all the way up to the Bombay High Court. He says, I'm not letting this go. What does the Bombay High Court say? Well, before we actually get into what the Bombay High Court says, and let's play a little game. I want you to think up of a lovely little bad word. And don't say it, we're in August company this evening. You can choose to be Slicer, you can choose to be Zimmerman. I mean, for me, my vocabulary in bad language doesn't go beyond I'll hit you or something like that. But that's where it is. So I hope you've got a little bad word in place. And let's see what the High Court says. It says, having regard to the provocation offered and to the ordinary habits and customs of Europeans in the matter of language of this kind, the retort given by the servant in no way justified the dismissal. The appeal was dismissed with cause. So the High Court says, oh, you Germans, you're used to bad language. So what's the big point? But the thing is that Slicer doesn't give it up without a fight. But 
so we know the slicer. He's an Oktoberfest drinking person who is doing shikar and all of that. But what does he do to the press? He turns the press around like nobody else does. Unfortunately, today we do not have any documents from the press of a catalog. But I have been able to find two documents in the course of my research for the book. And these are two price lists issued by the distributors. And these price lists have been priceless in so far as compiling the actual gamut of what is the output of the press. And it's prolific. It's huge. The number of things which he's doing is absolutely huge. One of the things which, which Slicer does at the time when the press is there is he starts embracing other artists also. So in addition to Ravi Varma, there are a number of other simply prolific artists who have now joined the press and their pictures are being printed. So we need to acknowledge them because they also go into building up the Ravi Varma brand. Here are some of them. This is by Mahadev Vishwanath Durandar. Can you believe it that the first substantial book on him has come out only last year? We've not researched him at all. A.M. Mali on the left, Kumbar on the right, we have no clue as to who these people are. The only reason we know that they are there is because Slicer is allowing them to put the imprint of their signature onto the oleograph. And that's how we know that these people actually did contribute to the Ravi Verma Press. G. V. Venkatesh Rao. Again, we don't know who he is, but in the process of me irritating the Royal, Royal Collection Trust in London, we found that there was a G. V. Venkatesh Rao there also. Navneet Krishna Besharma Brothers. Siddhalinga Swami on the left, he's a prolific Mysore artist and he even contributed to the press. C. G. Ramanujam on the right. Then they get into advertisements. And the one on the left is by K. Madhavan. Now K. Madhavan is an, uh, is, is an artist to watch out for. Because Stephen Inglis refers to him as the Norman Rockwell of South India. He came out with a lot of illustrations. We don't know much about him, but a lot of, lot of research is being done about the artist on the left. That's to watch out for, K. Madhavan. And then, of course, Dongre Balamavratham. And then he goes into printing books. A very rare book we were able to find. And this is of the Bonesley family, the family tree. And um, if you look at the pages, I mean, clearly the family is quite populated, very, very intricate. And then into picture postcards, playing cards, and textile labels. And to me, I was able to find one textile label which sort of summarized me also. Because what happens if a lawyer gets into art? He gets labeled. <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that is actually barrister chap, as in the stamp of approval of the barrister. But then for me, I mean, it's barrister chap. That's clearly not me. <laughs> so this is the kind of absolutely prolific work which the press is doing under Slaysha. But what does it do to his finances? Again, we get back into a legal record. And he executes a will in 1932. He dies in 1935. Again, it goes back into court. And here we do know the kind of money the man has made. He bequeaths the press to Laurie Lotter Slicer, his youngest daughter. And then if you look, he says, by his will dated November 30th, 1932, the deceased interalia bequeathed the Ravivarma Fine Art Litho Press with all its machinery to its youngest daughter, the plaintiff. But look at the bottom. Thereafter, he also bequeaths 10,000 should be paid to his daughter, Mary Rose, 25,000 to his daughter, Lily, and 1 lakh to his daughter, Wally, and the remainder to the plaintiff. So his estate is huge. It's in excess of a lakh and 35,000 rupees for 1935. This gives you an idea as to how very successful the press was. It was extremely successful at the time when Slicer was taking care of it. The press continues operation till 1973 and then it burns down. And it's very ironic that I was actually able to find a fire insurance policy taken by Slicer. Unfortunately, of course, it had 
it had expired in 1902. But in 1973, the press burns down. After that, I do not think any printing activity took place. The very last archival material which I was able to find in relation to the press is this one. And if you look at it, it is the time out in Bombay. And the one in the red circle, it says, uh, Editorial Office, Ravivarma Press, Malavli. Then I found a stash of letters where they've sent it out to advertisers. And he's saying, you know, you better advertise with us before your time runs out. Not realizing it's time out for the press. And this is the very last archival material I was able to find in relation to the press. What happens thereafter? It is a very sad story because you have the employees coming in to Robert. Robert by then is uh, managing the press. They say, you have to give us something as a payoff package. Robert says, I'm not giving you the machinery, but you can take the stones. So the stones go on to paving floors, to covering gutters, and in one instance actually paves the floor of a school. And it's very unfortunate because after the floor was paved, the children were not putting their feet on it because there were the imprints of gods there. So they come back to Robert and they say, what a bad idea. And he says, I have a solution. The solution is a solution of nitric acid. And the whole thing's wiped clean. And that's what we've done to our heritage. I, I, if I, I was thinking of whether I was going to show you the photograph and I said, no, I'm not going to show you that photograph. Because thereafter, whatever is left with the press is rescued and is taken into Manipal. And that is where it is today, in the Hasta Shilp Heritage Village. And it was Mr. Vijaynath Shanoi who brought in whatever was left. Now we go back to 1894. So we've seen the birth of Shakuntala, and let us look at what the others were. And this is the advertisement issue. So it says the birth of Shakuntala, the first oleographic picture. And then it says the second and third is the Lakshmi and Saraswati, priced at rupees two each. So we all, all, all also know prices now. The Lakshmi and Saraswati, when they were introduced in September of 1894, they were simply revolutionary. Why? They were revolutionary on many, many grounds. But I am going to restrict my lecture to one of them. I want you all to go back to 1894. And in 1894, someone came up to you and said, pray to Lakshmi. How would you imagine the deity? The academic class of society would be described the Dhyana Shlokam and said, oh, you know, she's sitting in Padmasanam and she's got Chaturbhuja, she's got Kamalas in two hands, she's got Abhayan Varada and she has two Gajas. If you really didn't understand that, then the only visual assistance was something like this. This is from the Sri Tathvanidhi. It was illustrative. Tanjo painting, Miso painting, all of these two-dimensional illustrative of a concept. The other thing which the academic class of society would have been taught is that the Lord resides in geometry, as in the Sri Chakram. No one really understood that. But this was the academic class of society. What happened to the common man? The common man was not given access to temples. And access to temples happens in 1936 with the Temple Entry Proclamation. It starts with the opening up of roads in Vaikyam. And thereafter, it, end, end, it results in the Temple Entry Proclamation. Until 1936, injunctions against religious access were very strong and intense. And much earlier, 1894, this woman gate crashes the whole thing. That's why she's important. That's why she's very important. Because she breaks every religious injunction barrier and she percolates herself into every home. That is why she's important. The second reason why she's important, the Bible says God created man in his own image. But man created God in his image here. For the first time, she's actually a human being. But who is she? Who is the girl who goes on to becoming brand Lakshmi? Let's, let's sort of do with this one on the models. 
Sugandha from Rangrasiya did not exist. Fact or fiction now I'm going to do. Complete fiction, Sugandha from Rangrasiya did not exist. This girl is Anjana by Malpekar. She did exist. She was a prolific musician. She sets up the Bendi Bazaar Garana. She's from Goa. She is a Kalavant. She's a very strong woman. But she met Ravi Verma only six years before he died in 1900. So no painting prior to 1900 can be attributed to Anjana by Malpekar. Not the Lakshmi, not the Saraswati, not the Mohini, not, not any painting which went to the Chicago. Because Ravi Verma met her only in 1900. But there was another girl. And she was very active in 1893-94. And this is the girl. And in the photograph, you actually see written at the bottom, Raji Bai of Bombay, our model. Now, Ravi Verma's work was actually being followed by a man called Bala Sahib, who was the prince of Aun. Then in his autobiography, he speaks of a model. And he actually says, I'm only reading the last few lines. It says, and this, this is from Rupika's book. He says, the ladies, uh, she, was a, she was very beautiful is what he says. The lady's face, body, and clothes are seen in several paintings, especially of Lakshmi and Saraswati. So ladies and gentlemen, for the first time, is Raji Bai posing for Lakshmi. She is the lady behind brand Lakshmi. And she is the one who raised a lot of curiosity with the NGMA invitation because a lot of people kept asking, who is she, who is she? I said, come, take a look. Ladies and gentlemen, Raji Bai Mulgaonkar. 125 years later, I lift the veil to show you Raji Bai Mulgaonkar posing for Lakshmi. And there she is. Ravi Verma did use photographs. And just to drive the point home, here is one example of Raja Raj Lakshman Das. And that's the photograph and that's the painting. The next oleograph is Saraswati. Now Saraswati is where I would like to explain the process of lithography. And these are some of the litho stones I was able to get. The one in the middle is the master stone. And if you see every little intricate thing there, each of, between each line was a shade. And each of the stones which you see on the sides represented one color. So a lithograph, a, 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 a chromolithograph would actually require you several prints of different colors for you to get the final. And here is a seven color oleograph. So this is the entire series. But it's difficult to understand. So I sort of did a video of it. And this is the first, which will be the flesh. Then comes ochre. Then black is added. This is the composite of three. Then pink or rose is added. Then you get four. Then red gets added. It becomes five. Blue gets added. Sorry, it becomes six. And then you have blue or gray. And you have the final. So it was a very complex method of printing. It wasn't, you know, put it into the computer and then say you have a thousand copies and walk away. It never happened like that. So this is how oleographs were actually printed. But what did oleographs do to all of us? One, it was completely revolutionary. Completely changed the aesthetic. It changed our perceptions of the divine. It changed our perceptions of normal aesthetics. It changed commercials. It changed comic culture. It changed cinema. It changed so many things. But I can't go into all of that today. So I decided I'm going to take the very witty ones. And what Ravi Verma's press does is it breaks the mold and it creates a new mold. And it is the new mold which we've still not been able to break away from today. So I had to quote... Alfred Lord Tennyson, the old order change its yielding place to new, and God fulfills himself in many ways. So let's look at some of the ways in which God fulfills himself. Quirky. 
So if Lakshmi and Saraswati has to be that beautiful, she has to be using Vinolia soap. And how else can she get a complexion like that? And then of course, Vishnu says, come on, Sri Devi and Bhu Devi, let's go with Garuda. And I have a new avatar. What's the avatar? To sell strawberry and apricot jam for C.E. Morton. And then about the one on the right. I mean, if Krishna could, a blue Krishna could be scrubbed so clean and made fair, it has to be kept. It simply had to be. I mean, there's no other explanation to it, right? <laughs> but these are doing very well. But the other thing which the oleographs are doing is it's actually influencing a whole range of new artists who are carrying on the, not only the print tradition, but the popular art tradition. And we, as Indians, we've completely forgotten that legacy. And so I intend to show you some of them today. This is a painting by V.V. V. Saparin, is clearly influenced by Ravi Varma's uh, Rama Vanquishing the Ocean. The, the ones on the right are paintings, mind you. The one on the left is a painting by Indra Sharma, influenced again by Ravi Varmas. And then the Madhavan, this Norman Rockwell, that chap, and his influence from Ravi Varmas Shankar. But it doesn't remain with just India. It goes way beyond. And look at some of the match labels. Made in Sweden. Made in Czechoslovakia. Made in Japan, and the Krishna is made in Austria. So clearly, Ravi Verma has done something where he creates not only a revolutionary image, he creates such an acceptable image that it goes all the way everywhere, and then everyone's now making matchboxes and this and that, mostly for Indian consumption, but then they're adding their own little bits to it, as you will see in this slide. You actually notice what's happened. So the one on the right is made in Japan. And now Menaka's got mongoloid eyes. And Vishwamitra's hair is like a Buddha. It's curled. So they've taken these images. They made it their own and they sort of sent it out. So acceptable. So it's revolutionary and then it's acceptable. Where Ravi Varma's press imagery which brings me to the last slide for the evening. And that is this one. I'm going to spend some time on this. I was walking one day in Madurai to this temple, Aragar Kovilne of Madurai, and I looked up at the Gopram, and I said, what? There was the birth of Shakuntala. So I ran back in, and the first thing I asked him was, when was the Gopram built? This is 30 years ago. I said, what image is that? Sir Ravi Varma. He said, oh. And then I wanted to sort of continue the cross-examination with him, but I, I don't think the guy was too interested. But I'm going, to, I'm going to take you through these three images. Look at the image on the right. That's the one we're celebrating 125 for today. But just understand what's happening there. Shakuntala has been born because of irresponsibility and immorality. And then Shakuntala is handing over the child to the father. And he says, no, I'm not going to take the child. In Ravi Varma's print imagery, I think this is probably the most inhumane picture you can come across. Because here's an innocent child and they're playing tennis with her. One's throwing it and the other's retorting it back by saying, no, I don't want. And it smacks of everything which is immoral, inhumane, irresponsible, and downright cruel. What did the child do? The child didn't do anything in the whole thing. But it gets perched onto a religious podium. How does that happen? So if you think about it, Ravi Varma's press imagery starts from becoming revolutionary, over the course of time becomes very acceptable, 
And even further down the line, even something as sordid as this gets sanctified. And then goes full circle and goes back into a religious place. And it is these three things, revolution, acceptability, and sanctification, which is what creates an imprint in our minds and in time. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Ganesh. Now we are, we are opening the floor for question and answer. We have 10 minutes. So we, we wouldn't be able to take all the questions, but for 10 minutes, we'll take whatever is possible. Hello. Uh, hi, sir. I would like to know if, uh, where we can find the content of this whole lecture and everything. Is it uh, uh, accessible online somewhere? No, or no, some? no. This will not be accessible online. Okay. Uh, yeah. If I'm uh, interested in knowing more and... You may, contact, you may contact the NGMA. Okay. Yes. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Anybody else? I mean, my lecture could not have been so clear that there are no questions. Oh, there's one there. Huh? Yeah, sure. Yes. So I have a question uh, with regard to the whole lithographic process. Uh, something that I was noticing while you were sharing all these, you know, comparative images is that, and I've noticed this before about lithographs, but uh, the color palette within lithos are very similar, right? So the aesthetic of the color, like the tonality of the color, the saturation level of the colors that are used in lithos are very specific. So, I mean, just as a personal commentary on like on an artistic level, how do you feel that that uh, kind of affects the image itself because there are some paintings where the you know the tones are so different from the lithos. See the uh, apples and oranges because the painting is an entirely different medium and the oleograph is an entirely different medium. So really, you can't get both of them exactly similar, especially when you're mass producing them on such a scale. So you must understand that the paintings chartered down a different path, and that was completely different from what the oleographs were doing. The oleographs set out on a journey to democratize art. So to some extent, so if you look at the very early oleographs, which were by the fine art lithographic press, they were actually like wash colors. But very much later, when Slysher takes it on, one of the ways in which he improves his commercials is to use something called a stippling effect. So what they used to do is they used to hammer little holes into it and the ink would penetrate in. So he was able to get more impressions out of a single stone. That is one of the ways. So the later oleographs you can clearly make out, if you look very close, it's like pointillism. It's tiny little dots which go into making a larger picture, which you'll not find in the first oleographs. The first few oleographs did not retain too much of ink. So in the process of which, Maybe for the, maybe about 200, 300 impressions, the stone had to be redone, but not with the later ones. And that's how he sort of achieved uh, commercial success. Slysher achieved this. This somebody told me from uh, Chitrakala Parishad and actually explained how that happened. So, <clears throat> in a way, he was uh, kind of the first artist to commercialize the image of God, uh, images of God. So he must have faced a lot of flag from society. So See, how did he handle the entire? Uh, I don't think he he really um, I don't think he really cared about it, but he did face a lot of opposition. Not only not only uh, were critics writing by saying, "Oh, you know, these are so democratic. How do you call them art?" Um, Sister Nivedita actually the, she criticizes uh, the Shakuntala by saying here is a woman lying on grass and this is a picture found in every home so I was really wondering which of the two she was more upset about but you know if you think about it from that point of view when the criticism was being made we were living in a different time where there were certain things which were taken for granted for instance in 1894-ish uh, monarchies were the rule, and democr democracies were the exception. Wealth concentration with the few was the rule. Spreading out wealth was a very much later concept. Religion for a few was the rule. Opening it up was not known at that point of time. I mean, even if you take something as simple as, um, 
you go on a road and you can get a biryani in 1894 a pulao or a biryani was an exotic dish even ghee was an exotic thing so all of a sudden when you had art proliferating into every home they just didn't know how to handle it so they simply said then this is not art but it, the reality is that these were all revolutionary they broke so many barriers and ravi verma i think did it ravi verma uh, there were other presses which also were established chitrashala chitrapriya prakash press was there the calcutta art studio was there and these were all doing well but none of them branded themselves the way in which the ravi verma pressed it and so that's that's why today there's actually a lot of confusion practically everything is ravi verma is because the branding was so good branding was very good may i yes first of all congratulations and thank you this is an absolutely remarkable story to be taken through my question was basically about print runs sorry print runs yes in terms of quantities in terms of numbers yes obviously these weren't limited editions no they were for example everybody's favorite lakshmi how mm. would have been printed so the year or over a period of time before the plates were either destroyed or did that happen at all i don't think the uh, firstly there were stones i don't think the stones yeah the stones were not destroyed the stones could be reused over and over again i was able to find one uh, one um, purchase order so uh, it's one purchase order but then it, there you have uh, i think it said um, purchase uh, placed an order for tilottama 6 urvashi 6 and lakshmi 3000 so i mean if that sort of gives you an idea as to what was being favored this also helps us tell us which are the rare ones because the lakshmi and all of these were not too rare but the tilottamas and urvashis and all became extremely rare in course of time because a lot got destroyed as well since every household has one of the prints of raja ravi or ravi arma in the recent times how is it that they managed to keep um the same similar features the, the similarity is so same even after so many years how is it possible see the prints stopped in 1973 so what we have today are all the things which were printed only at that point of time so the, the later prints have all been derivative of the original theme by different presses and different artists but in those days at the time when um, the ravi verma press was functional they had a system called the progressive proof so what they did was they printed the series of colors and then they printed all of them onto a single sheet and on the side you would have all the colors in the form of an index so what they used to do is every new print run was compared to the progress proof so in that way they sort of maintained some amount of quality the fact remains is the earlier oleographs the quality is very well maintained but the later oleographs start sort of going this way and that way because either there's no comparison going on or they're trying to extract a lot more out of the stone which the stone was not in a position to actually do so the later you get a lot of blurs and all that but the earlier ones are very good but how they maintain the same stereotype was using the progressive proof signature of ravi varma on the oleographs in comparison to the paintings because there's so many paintings these days being called as ravi varma with no signature so if you look at the gamut of ravi varma's work as a painter versus the ones which get printed you can actually make out that he excluded some paintings which never became oleographs one is i think they went by what would be popular and what would be acceptable so there are actually i was able to find uh, a very rare painting uh, of um, uh, vishnu maya of Shiv, of uh, shiva and uh, mohini in embrace it never went on to becoming an oleograph but we see the previous mohini so it stops there so there was a lot of filtration which actually took place as to what paintings went into becoming oleographs and what paintings did not become oleographs clearly the portraits did not become except very rare ones of political leaders or something like that like um, uh, the one which you saw over here which was govardhan lal ji who was the tilkayat of uh, nathwara so he was a very important man those portraits got done but normal portraits did not did not happen 
Mythological certainly happened because everyone loved the mythology. Gods and goddesses certainly happened. That, uh, and of course, the beautiful women, everybody loved them. So those went on to becoming, uh, those went on to becoming oleographs. But some of the paintings which are very personal did not become. The signature is interesting. I was able to find that uh, they had a separate stamp. So you have the stones and they had separate stamps with Ravi Varma, Turandar, Mali, all of these people. So there's a box full of them. And over the course of time, some got printed with others. <laughs> yes, so there is one painting of uh, um, Krishna and Yashoda. You know the one where she he got scrub, the blue card? Yeah, so that is actually by Ravi Varma. But when the oleograph comes out in the Ravi Varma press, it's signed by Durandar. So I think there was a... I, I don't think all of them read the uh, instruction book clear, <laughs> very uh, clearly. There, there's a lot of that which happens. So unless you're able to correlate it to a Ravi Varma style or correlate it to a Ravi Varma original painting, it's actually difficult to tell you insofar as some of the unsigned works as to who uh, painted each of these uh, oleographs. Yes. Yeah, hi. Do you think there was a certain whitewashing um, in Varma's works, especially in terms of skin color? And do you think that was intentional or just something that he might have taken from European paintings? You see, that's an interesting question. Uh, whitewashing is a criticism, if it is a criticism. Okay, let, I'll answer it this way. If whitewashing is a criticism, it is a criticism which cannot be levied only against Ravi Verma. Why? Because Ravi Verma followed some of the descriptions, especially that in Vishnu Dharmottara. And in Vishnu Dharmottara, they were already things that she's fair, she's pink, she's this way, she's that way. For instance, Shiva, the Dhyana Shlokam says, Spatika Manini Bam Parvati Sham Namami. So there are already descriptions found in the earlier scriptures saying Shiva is fair. So uh, you can't attribute that to Ravi Verma who followed the very same scriptural thing to make a painting. This is one. Two, did Ravi Verma paint only fair people? No. He painted a number of dark people also, especially when it came to portraits. So he was very particular that the tonality of that particular complexion was maintained. A number of paintings by Ravi Verma of dark people do exist. His own wife was very dark. So um, if Ravi Verma was painting a portrait, he would, he would follow the tonality or the skin complexion of the person. But if he was painting for an oleograph, or if a painting of his was used for an oleograph, in that particular case, he would simply follow what was generally acceptable or what was found in the scripture. There is one very interesting note. Uh, when Ravi Verma painted uh, the Sita Swayamvaram or the Rama breaking the bow for so there's actually a letter written by Ravi Verma to uh, the uh, secretary of the Maharaja of Mysore by saying, even before I embark on it, do you want your Rama painted fair or dark? He asks. So when he painted specifically for a particular patron, he asked. Um, there is a sketch actually of the Rama in a dark complexion. But finally, of course, the painting is fair. So clearly somewhere an instruction came in by saying paint it fair. Ravi Verma would have just done it. So I don't think you can attribute whitewashing to Ravi Verma. And if you attribute it to him, you'll attribute it to the whole system. So I think... Oh, there's one more there. Oh, uh, hi, Ganesh. So during this printmaking, did the costume colors get changed from one batch of the print to another? Because I recollect seeing Ahalya, I think, at Delhi and GMA in a kind of off-white sari, the one lady in the swing. And at other places, I've seen the same uh, with different colors. Yes, not only did Ravi Verma change, uh, not only did the printing process change some of the colors from the painting to the print, but also between print runs, we do see change of colors. But there, there's, a, it has, there's, a, there's something which we have to be careful about, is because we do not know today, because there's been a lot of discoloration of the paper, we do not know as to whether the original print would have been 
cream, white, something like that. So uh, it's, it's actually a little difficult to say uh, how accurate the colors were because the oleographs as we see them today are substantially dark because of the paper, not because of the, uh, because of the paper and because of the varnish layer on top. Board of the temple uh, architecture versus the painting, I noticed that the artist maintained the dominance of Menaka in that particular incident um, in the painting, but in that sculpture it had been purged. Yes, that, because that, the sculpture is not Pera Verma. <laughs> the painting... Yeah. I don't know if it was a purging to uh, decrease the importance of Menaka. I don't, see, the problem I'll tell you is no one's understanding Ravi Varma and the Kathakali placement. So everyone thinks anything can go everywhere. No, Ravi Varma did not do that. Ravi Varma was very careful as to who went where in a particular canvas because he understood hierarchy. In fact, he made such a faux pas with Vishakam Tirunal on hierarchy that he almost got declared personal non grata and he had to leave. So hierarchy at that point of time was very, very important. So Ravi Verma ensured that on his canvases they were there. But then later derivations of people using sculptures and misplacing things, I mean, clearly not Ravi Verma. But Ravi Verma's was always a Kathakali placement. So I think uh, we have come to the end of the Thank you. talk. So firstly, uh, I'd like to call the Director, National Gallery of Modern Art, Ms. Nazneen Banu, to Thank Mr. Ganesh for being here and delivering this wonderful uh, talk and giving a lot of insight on Ravi Verma. So, on, the, on behalf of National Gallery of Modern Art, Government of India, Ministry of Culture, I thank, uh, firstly thank Mr. Ganesh, thank the director for being here with us uh, for the talk and uh, I thank one and all for being here, a uh, warm evening. And also I would request all of you to kindly follow us on Facebook, Twitter and we are also on YouTube for uh, the videos which you have missed the event to look up on our uh, YouTube page. Uh, thanks one and all. Uh, and a warm evening.